Years ago, I found myself on an airplane traveling from Colorado Springs to Atlanta, and I sat down next to this lady. Some of you have heard me tell this story before. We weren't even off the ground when she asked me about, you know, who I was and what I did. And I said, well, you know, hey, I work for a, a Christian organization here in town. And when she heard that, she cocked her head back at me and she said, huh, I'm an atheist. Prove me wrong. Now, this was the start of a three-hour flight, which quickly became a three-hour fight. Now, I know, listen, this is prior to 9-11, where you could talk about religion and politics on airplanes. And by the way, my theory is, is that if they want to fight, you can fight too. In fact, after about 30 minutes or so, and we were really in the, you know, the throes of this deep conversation about faith and truth and so on, I just stopped and I said, now, now, now listen, are, are you okay? Because I like these kind of conversations, but I know that I'm weird and... I don't want to ruin your day or your flight, so if you want to go to sleep or at least pretend like you're sleeping so you don't have to talk to me, I'm okay. And she was like, are you kidding? I'm having a great time. Are you okay? And so then we ended up fighting for three hours, and every 30 minutes we'd stop and check on each other. And we talked about all kinds of things, uh, because that's what happens. What you believe about God is what you believe about everything else. And so we talked about morality and history. I think we might have even hit sports and education uh, and, and so on. But the conversation really launched off right off the bat when she she pointed at me and she said, how can you believe in God? Now look, I I've been to seminary. I paid someone a lot of money to know the answer to that question. I've learned the five classical proofs for God's existence in their various forms. But someone had taught me a very important point. And if you've listened to Breakpoint, if you've listened to me speak, uh, if you've read A Practical Guide to Culture, our book, then you know that this is one of the things that we really emphasize. And that is, before you give an answer, sometimes it's better to ask a question. And that's especially true when it comes to defining words. Because she said, prove to me that God exists. And instead of jumping into the proofs, I stopped and said, now wait a minute, what do you mean by God? And her answer to me was a grumpy old man with a beard in the sky who can't wait for you to do something wrong so he can strike you dead with a lightning bolt. I promise that's what she said. And my answer to her was, lady, I don't believe in Zeus. I don't want to defend him. And it's fascinating that I could have jumped into all of my reasons, but what I would have been doing would have been defending an idea of God that I don't believe in. But this is not just something that we have to acknowledge and deal with when it comes to God. We live in what is called the, the world of information. In the first module, we talked about truth, and we started by defining truth. Why? It's the same reason that we're starting this module defining love. Because in an age of information, you live in a culture where ideas are swarming around, and oftentimes those ideas come at us unargued but assumed. And they come at us even more subtly, not by any sort of blatant articulation of this idea, but it's embedded in the way words are used. In other words, in an age of information, you and I have got to fight for the definition of words. G.K. Chesterton said, if words aren't worth fighting for, what on earth would be? Another quote attributed to Confucius, and I'm not sure it's actually him because every other quote is attributed to Confucius, and I'm not sure we really know what, actually know what he actually said, but uh, is that when words lose their meaning, people lose their lives. In other words, there is a consequence, a whole series of consequences that start in a culture where words mean something and then turn around and mean something else. Now, we have a whole section on this in A Practical Guide to Culture where we talk about the importance of keeping, if you're a parent or a grandparent or a youth pastor or mentoring another, someone else or having a conversation with a, a, a strange person on an airplane like me, that one of the questions you should keep in your back pocket is that question of definition. What do you mean by that? She asked me, how can you believe in God? Well, what do you mean by God? Right? And you can see this playing out across all kinds of other questions. But in A Practical Guide to Culture, and if you've heard me speak on uh, some of that content, uh, one of the things that I'll say over and over and over, that of all the words that we need to most carefully define in this cultural moment as followers of Christ, uh, is the word love. Love is a word that gets used without definition. But the way that it's used 
is loaded with definitions over and over and over. And one of the things we talk about in A Practical Guide to Culture, and if you've heard me speak on that content at all, you know that there are a bunch of words that I think in particular need to be carefully defined in this cultural moment. Truth is one of them, and, and Sean and Abdu and some of the other speakers in Module 1 did such a great job at hitting that from a, a, number, of angle, a, a number of angles. But I do think, I do think that maybe the most important word uh, that needs to be carefully defined. The most important concept in this cultural moment that needs to be carefully defined is the word love. And, and, and I, I want to suggest that for two reasons. Number one is because getting love right is not a, a peripheral concern for a Christian. It is a central concern for a Christian. As, uh, as Dr. Bill Brown, who's the, the dean of our Colson Fellows program and a personal mentor of mine, often points out, the greatest command that Jesus said was the greatest command isn't to know. It isn't even to believe. It isn't to trust and it's not to obey. What is it? It's to love. That's the greatest command, to love God. And the second one is like unto it, right? And that is to love our neighbor as ourselves. In other words, we're not going to get Christianity right if we don't know what love is. That's the summary, Jesus said, of all the commandments. The second reason I think we need to prioritize getting the definition of love right is not only because of its central place in a Christian worldview, as important that, as that is, but because we live in a culture where I'm not sure on a popular level we ever hear the word love used in an appropriate way. Let me say that again, because that's, a, that, that's, that, that's a, 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 a hyperbolic sort of comment. But I believe it, that we never see and hear in the larger culture, especially pop culture, the word love used in an appropriate or an accurate way. Let me tell you a story of how this can impact folks. Um, uh, a lot of times when you get done speaking, it won't happen today since I'm talking on a camera, but a lot of times when you get done speaking, um, uh, people will come up and talk to you. And a lot of times I really enjoy that. You get to meet new people, you get to hear their thoughts and so on. Sometimes, however, you see the people coming up to talk to you and you see the look on their face and you think to yourself, I'm not sure I want to talk to that person. Well, this actually happened to me once in South Carolina. I was speaking at a Christian school and I made a sarcastic comment. I know no, that's hard for you to believe. Uh, sarcasm is my spiritual gift. And I made a sarcastic comment about a movie that was very popular at the time. It was a movie called The Notebook. It was based on a novel by Nicholas Sparks by the same name. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about and you've read any Nicholas Sparks novel, then you do know what I'm talking about because if you've read one, you've read them all. But basically, the, 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 the plot of the story is, is that there is an an older woman who's in a home. She has Alzheimer's or dementia. She can't really remember who she is or anyone else. And a older man shows up and uh, every single day. And he has a notebook and he finds her sitting on the bench there in the beautiful garden and he sits beside her and says, can I read you a story? And she says, yes. And what she realizes as the story goes on is that this story is actually about her and it's actually about them. And basically he's reminding her of her own love story with him. He's her husband and by the end of the day, sometimes she makes those connections and they're able to have an intimate loving moment again before her memory is stolen away. And so I had made a sarcastic comment about that movie and uh, after I get done speaking, uh, two female students and a female teacher make a beeline to me. And I see them coming and I think to myself, I don't want to talk to them. So I tried to get away. Honestly, I did. I tried to get away. And I got caught up in this group of students and it was this really strange experience uh, because I heard the footsteps. Now, if you've never played football, you don't know that reference. But if you have played football, what that means is you're going across the middle and you know you're about to get drilled by someone. But you can't see them. You just hear the footsteps. I had that that same feeling and it was so strange because usually on the football field you're hearing footsteps from overweight men this was three ladies and I turned around to them and one of the the teacher actually looked at me and glared like steam coming out of her nostrils and said to me what's wrong with the notebook that was a beautiful picture of love that man stuck by his wife till the very end 
And suddenly I realized we needed to go a little bit deeper than just my uh, surface level sarcastic comment. And as I said to her, you're right, what that husband did and showing up every day and, and actually reading and, and trying to win her love again was itself an act of love. I said, so the problem wasn't that. The problem was the story that was in the notebook that supposedly brought them to the happy ending. Do you remember that part of it? If you've seen the movie? Basically, their love story that he reads starts way back when they were teenagers. You know, one summer they see each other. And you have these two teenagers who see each other and immediately have strong feelings for each other. And they fall in love. And they're attracted to each other, even though her dad says he's a bum and he kind of was a bum. But, you know, that's just what mean dads do. They just want to make their daughters miserable. So she disobeys him. And she actually, by the end of the summer, they jump into bed together. And then the father finds out and really separates them, but their feelings are so strong, even though they're separate, they still have strong feelings for each other. And then there's a war, and the war really separates them. So the guy goes off to fight in the war, and the girl, she goes off to be a nurse in the war, and they still write because they have these strong feelings for each other, but then their letters don't get to each other, and then they, they lose contact, and then the guy's really badly injured, so he's kind of out of the picture for a while, and the girl, uh, as a nurse, treats this other patient who falls in love with her, and she develops feelings for him, but not only does she have feelings for him, she still has feelings for the first guy, so there's feelings here, feelings there, feelings everywhere. And, and so, but this guy has fallen in love with her, so he proposes to her, and even though she still has feelings for this first guy, she, she says yes, so she makes a commitment to that guy, and, and to his family, and to her family, that they're going to get married. But then, this other guy comes back into the picture, and without even her telling her fiancé, she, she breaks her commitment to him and runs and jumps back into bed with this first guy and because, you know, the feelings are just so strong. And now, you know, 40 years later, they're, they're still in love because those feelings, you know, they never go away, just like real life. Now, here's the point. What is the point? The point is, is how does that movie define love? Some of you have heard me quote C.S. Lewis. I think he's the one who said that the most dangerous ideas in a society aren't the ones that are argued, but the ones that are assumed. And, and, and by the way, movies and entertainment assumes ideas in very powerful ways by how it uh, carries a plot, but, you know, by, by what it is, what forces carry a plot, or who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. And you see that really at work in this particular uh, 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 th this particular movie in a really powerful way. But how does that movie uh, define love as a set of feelings that never go away? Now let me just ask, if you're a married couple watching this with your kids, do the feelings ever go away? <laughs> do you ever wake up some mornings and the feelings aren't quite there like they used to be? Now, I know what some of you are thinking is like, Shh, she's sitting right here. I get that. But listen, the feelings change. The feelings ebb and flow. Sometimes they're strong. Sometimes they're not. But isn't that a very common way that our culture defines and understands the word love? In fact, I would say that not only, to get a little, maybe to get a little more specific, not only does our culture define love as feelings, it defines them as one of two feelings. Whenever we hear the word love used in a song, in a commercial, um, even in political speak, which makes it even more bizarre, uh, we uh, did a massive uh, altering of our understanding of the most basic unit of society uh, based on a use of the word love. So not only does our culture use the word love almost always as nothing more than a feeling, but to, to get a little bit more specific, what it does is it uses it as one of two feelings. One is either a feeling of sensuality or sexuality, uh, where, where, where love is seen as this kind of animal impulse of which I'm not in control over, uh, or the, the, the other way, the other sort of feeling is sentimentality, that we define it down uh, as a feeling of uh, uh, almost nostalgia or um, you, you know, but, but in both cases, and this is what's so interesting, both cases of, of these feelings, love then, get this, becomes not only a feeling, but it becomes something that happens to us. In other words, like we fell into it, like we fell into a hole, like we've got, you know, kind of no say over the matter whatsoever. So the love is disconnected from the will. 
And if we disconnect it from the will, then we're disconnecting it from Christian discipleship. Because who on earth decides what, what they fall into or who they're attracted to or anything like that? It gets completely divorced from any control that we have. And then, if, if, if that's what we mean by love, and then by the way, this is what I tell parents and youth pastors and grandparents. Look, if the only way our students have ever heard the word love used is either in a sexual way or a sentimental way and always as a feeling, never as anything cognitive or willful or, 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 or under uh, Christian discipline or discipleship or anything like that, what do we think they mean when they say, I love this girl or I love this guy? Or what do we think they, they mean when they say, I love God or that God loves me? I mean, do they really think, in fact, I, by the way, I, I think that one of the culprits in all this is some of the songs that we sing. And I'm not going to name any song. I get in enough trouble for naming songs uh, that we sing that are heretical. But um, th 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 there are times we sing of God's love as if he has no control over it either. A as if it, it is something that is out of his control and out of our control. And if it's nothing more than he feels very strongly about us. The, the problem, of course, with all of this is that anyone who has a child knows that if, if, if your love for your child never extends beyond an emotion, where you're actually intentionally choosing, I am going to do these sorts of things because I love them. It's for their good even if they don't know it. It's for their good, even if they don't feel it. It's for their good, even if I don't feel it. Once you have to get into that sort of relationship, suddenly you realize that this small little shriveled understanding of love that we have is just not big enough uh, to, 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 for, for really what we need, not just in our vertical relationship with God, but in our horizontal relationships with one another. And you better believe it. When my daughters come to me, and they say, Daddy, I love that boy. The first question that I'm going to ask them is, what do you mean by love? Second question is, what do you mean by boy and where is he? But, you know, what do you mean by love? Um, because if, if, our, if our categorical imagination of something as central to the human experiment as love, the, th the, th the thing from which most theologians would land on is the reason anything exists at all. It's a, an, ex an expression of God's love. The thing that sets God himself apart in our Christian Trinitarian understanding, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, from, from Islam, which denies any sort of community in the Godhead and just sees it as this radical monotheism. But one of the big distinctions there is what does it mean to say that God is love if there was nothing other than God, if there was no other whatsoever? But in the Trinity, you have God is one and God is other all at the same time. God the Father loved God the Son and God the Son loved God the Spirit and God the Spirit loved God the Son and God the Father. You have this inner Trinitarian community that's defined by love. That changes the entire nature of reality, doesn't it? Because in an Islamic conception, God just does love if He wants to. In a Christian understanding, God is love. And therefore, all of His acts, the creation of the world, the punishment of sin, the salvation of the wicked, all of that stuff reflects this non-negotiable concept that it's at the heart of all that is. Man, if, 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 if we don't know what love is, we're going to get the entire Christian worldview wrong. And as we're going to see in modules here to come, we're going we're to confuse it with stuff like niceness. We're going to confuse it with silly little shriveled up concepts like tolerance. We're, we're, we're going to confuse love. And we're going to substitute it out and replace it with something that just can't handle the real world of image bearers who are created uh, in His image and in His likeness. And, 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 and it certainly is not going to be able to handle the fall, the brokenness that exists 
between image bearers and their God, and between image bearers and themselves, and between image bearers and others, and between image bearers and the created order. We've got to get love right. And that's why I'm just so thrilled to be a part of this, this module, and especially what you're going to hear next. Because if, if I'm honest, I'll be honest, I thought to myself, well, we can start with trying to figure out how we've gotten love wrong, but we've got to get love right. And, of course, John's really clear on that. He says, if you want to know what love is, this is what love is. Not that we loved Him, but that He first loved us. So, in other words, if we're going to get the notion of love right, we've got to know what it means that God loves us. And I thought to myself, who do I want to hear from to tell me what it means that God loves me? That God loves my kids, that God loves my wife, that God loves my family, that God loves His church, that God loves His world. And I'm so honored uh, uh, that Johnny Erickson Todd is going to follow this up and give us some clarity on that point. But let's not confuse this magnificent, beautiful concept that's at the center of all that holds the created order together because it's the emanation of who God Himself is for something silly like we often confuse it for. We've got to get love right.